Hello and welcome back to building a fantasy game console emulator. If you haven't seen the previous video, you might want to check that out first, since that will explain a lot of the architecture and memory map of the system that we're trying to build here. We left off in the previous video having built out the bulk of the drawing code for the graphics pipeline, which draws to a 240 by 112 pixel screen made up of 30 by 14 8 by 8 pixel tiles, giving us a total of 420 tiles and a total of 26,880 pixels. In reality, however, we're actually drawing many more pixels than that because the console's display is scaled to look halfway decent on a modern system. The current scale factor is six, meaning that we're actually drawing 161,280 pixels per frame. And right now, we're not doing this very efficiently. Every single frame, for every tile we're drawing, including the background, foreground, and sprites, we're going to look up that tile's data. A 32-byte structure where every four bits encodes a pixel color index. We need to take that color index and look it up in the system's color palette, finally drawing the pixel. Actually, we're drawing two pixels at a time since we read bytes, but that's beside the point. And the worst part is, we're doing this even if we need to fill an entire screen with a single tile. Oftentimes, when faced with this kind of problem, one where computation of a small piece can slow everything down in the aggregate, the answer is to use a cache. A cache represents a trade-off where we need extra redundant memory resources, but in return we get fast access to previous computations, which we hope are faster than just calculating the values again from scratch. Caches are notorious for being difficult to invalidate properly. That is, knowing when the value in your cache doesn't correspond to reality anymore. And that's often riddled with edge cases. But we have something on our side which will actually make this quite straightforward. Remember in the system overview, I mentioned that tile memory is read-only. That means that any cached representation we make of tiles are guaranteed to be valid the entire time that the system is running. So if we were, for instance, to cache all 256 tiles at system startup, then when drawing, we'd never actually have to look up tile memory at all. Now, we've been a bit abstract up until this point, so let's get concrete. There are two facts about the canvas element which are going to help us write our caching mechanism. The first is that the canvas element can be created, drawn to, and otherwise manipulated without ever being attached to the DOM. The second is that a canvas element can be drawn as an image to any other canvas element simply using context.drawImage. With this information in hand, let's actually start with the implementation. Those previous facts should hint that we're going to need to work with multiple canvas elements, but the functions we wrote last time are specialized to work with only the main screen canvas, since they use the context variable directly. One way we could make these functions more generic would be to make context an argument. But in the interest of showing some other techniques for code reuse, we're going to approach this in another way. We can convert the arrow function to a regular function and change context to instead reference this.context. When we come to use these functions later, we'll call them in a way that context is correct for whatever canvas we're dealing with at the time. We can do this for draw pixel too. In draw pixel, we actually use the color function. If we leave it as it is now, when it gets called, the this which is used inside the function is actually going to point to the global object, which in the browser is the window object. Instead, we're going to use the call method, which allows us to tell color what this is. Here we're going to pass along this from the current function. Call actually takes two arguments, and the second argument is the actual argument that we're going to call the function with, in this case, the color value. Now we can scroll down to the draw tile function and convert it from an arrow function. Notice that we use the draw pixel function here. We have to do the same thing again, only since we need to provide multiple arguments to the draw pixel function, we're actually going to use apply instead of call. Apply's second argument is an array of arguments to pass to the function, so we can just encase the rest of the arguments here in an array. Now we're ready to write a cacheable tile mechanism. 
I'll create a class called tile, and in the constructor, we'll take an array of tile data, just like we saw in the previous episode. Remember, this array just contains a sequence of 32 bytes that represent the color values for a single tile. In the constructor, we'll create and assign a canvas object using document.create. This is a free floating canvas, not connected to the DOM. We'll grab its context object and assign it to this, and then set the height and the width of the canvas to be the dimensions of a single tile. Finally, as a last step, we'll call draw tile using apply, passing in this tile instance as the this argument and draw the tile data at position 0, 0. When draw tile is called, it will later call draw pixel, again using this tile instance, and both the color setting and the drawing that take place will be done in the context of this free floating canvas. This is a powerful and misunderstood feature of JavaScript, which can allow for code reuse via composition, and is well worth understanding, though it's probably not always the clearest or most debuggable way to write code. When a tile is constructed, it will, in that moment, create a canvas in the background and immediately draw the tile data to it, effectively caching the operation for us. To actually draw these cache tiles to the screen, we're going to create another class called Renderer. The Renderer will put a layer of abstraction between the Fantasy Console and the canvas, so that the Fantasy Console only has to be aware of tiles and the screen space without having to worry about canvas APIs or the screen scaling factor or anything like that. In the constructor, we'll receive a canvas object and set a context property on the instance. Next, we can add a method called drawGridAlignedTile. This method is similar to the drawTile method on the tile class, but it will take a cached tile instance instead of raw tile data. Inside the method, we can call this.context.drawImage, passing tile canvas as the image data and multiplying the tile x and tile y positions by the scale factor in order to bring them into screen space. Then again, by the pixels per tile in order to ensure that the tile is aligned to the grid. We can make a very similar method called draw pixel aligned tile, where the x and y positions are related to pixels instead of grid positions meaning that we only need to multiply the coordinates by the scale factor. Finally, just for the sake of utility, let's add a clear method that will clear the entire screen state. We can call into color with an explicit color value of white. Then we only need to call this.context.fillRect, starting at the top left-hand corner at 0, 0, and going all the way down to the bottom right with width and height. We can scroll down and refactor our old example to use these classes and make sure everything is working as expected. The tile that was moving on screen last time, whose tile data is explicitly written out, gets wrapped up into a tile class. The black and blue tiles we generated programmatically that we used in the background are also wrapped. Then we can create a renderer instance passing in a reference to the screen canvas. Now we can change some of the calls in our drawing loop. For example, we're manually clearing the screen here, but instead we can use renderer.clear. Then, instead of calling draw tile, we'll call renderer.drawgridaligned tile, removing the code that deals with scaling since we've abstracted that away into the renderer itself. Lastly, we can change draw tile for the moving tile to be renderer.drawpixelaligned tile instead. Now let's serve up the page using whatever web server we happen to have at our disposal. In this case, I'll use one that comes with Python 2 and check in with the browser. As expected, the same visuals are drawn, but this time you'll notice that the animation is running quite a bit smoother. Instead of computing more than 26,000 individual draw calls to the canvas, this time we're only drawing 421 times. Perfect. Let's export the renderer and the tile class and remove all the test code from this file and turn our attention to integrating the rest of the system so that we can actually run real code on the fantasy game console. Now, in the background, I've made a few minor changes to the VM code. This has mostly been adding some new instructions related to moving 8-bit values around. I'll put some notes and links in the description if you're curious to see exactly how that works, but if you've been following along with the VM series, it won't be anything you haven't seen already. 
I've also expanded on the create memory file, exporting a create RAM and a create ROM. Again, you'll find a little bit of extra information below, but it's nothing that you haven't seen in this series already. The memory mapper class now takes a size instead of an end address, since this is just a little bit easier to work with. The assembler code has been wrapped up into a function that receives a code string and an entry point address and returns an array of machine instructions and addresses of the resolved symbols. All we've done here is take the functionality that we'd hard coded and wrapped it up into a function which we can use in other places. The last thing I changed in the meantime was more of an oversight in the assembly language design. On instructions where a register value is used as an address, the ampersand character precedes the register name. But this also happens for instructions where a literal value is used as an address, where an ampersand precedes the literal value. Since all literal values are expressed in hexadecimal, there's an ambiguity on an instruction like this. Are we referring to the accumulator register, or are we referring to the hexadecimal number ACC? In order to fix this in the simplest way possible, I've just changed the name of the accumulator mnemonic to ACU instead. As a last aside, everything we've done in the VM series up until now has been running in Node with no external dependencies. For the graphics pipeline development of the fantasy console, we switched to the browser and used a simple web server to get the HTML and a single JavaScript file running. Now that we're going to start integrating it with the many other files that make up this project, we need to be able to build the whole project and serve it easily. So reluctantly, I'm going to add a package JSON and a single dependency, which will be a bundler, taking all of the JavaScript code and building it into a single file so we can serve it in the browser. That bundler is parcel, and when it's installed, I'll add the one line of required configuration, along with an NPM script to build and serve the project. Let's create a new file that will house our integrated system. We'll start by building out the memory map that was described in the last video. We can import the memory mapper class, as well as create RAM and create ROM. We'll also need the tile and renderer classes we just wrote, the CPU, and the assemble function. There'll be fewer RAM and ROM segments than the individual components described in the memory map. So let's start out by defining some size constants for the regions we will have. Tile memory is a ROM of hex 2000 bytes. Then we have a segment of RAM that covers the interrupt vector, the sprite table, background memory, and foreground memory, which is hex 628 bytes in total. Then input memory, where the results of button presses will be available, is a ROM of eight bytes. Technically, it's not actually a ROM, but the ROM interface that we have won't allow the programmer to write into the region. We'll be writing those values directly from the emulator side as the input comes in. Finally, we'll have another RAM segment that covers the global settings, game code and data, and the stack. We'll calculate the size of this section, starting with hex 10,000 bytes and subtracting all other section sizes. We can initialize the RAM and ROM devices using the sizes we've just defined. To actually link these devices with the address space, we can create a memory mapper instance and map in all of our various devices. Here you can see we're providing the size instead of an end address like we've done in previous episodes, and I've just found that this is a nicer interface to work with. Now that we've got all of the memory set up, we can actually put some stuff into it. Later, we'll be wrapping all of this up in some kind of cartridge format and encapsulating the functionality of the emulator. But in order to test this out now, we can just dump our data directly into the various devices. Let's make a function that will generate tile data, where any given tile is just a single block of color. We'll assume C is going to be a value between 0 and 16 to match up with the color palette. And we'll have an array of 32 bytes where each byte is just the color shifted to the left by four bits and ord with itself, giving us a full byte and two pixels worth of data. Next, we can create an array called full color tiles and fill it up with 16 tiles. We'll load that array into tile memory using the load method directly on the tile memory instance. Now that we have those tiles defined, we can set our background memory to reference them. We'll need some constants for that. The address offset of background memory, which is 
hex 2220, the address offset of foreground memory, tiles x, which is the number of tiles we have in the x direction, and tiles y, which is the number of tiles we have in the y direction. This includes additional tiles that render off screen and only show if the screen is scrolled using the global settings registers. We can create a for loop that goes over the number of tiles in background memory and calculate an X position for this tile based on its index using the modulo operator. Then we can calculate its Y position by flooring the result of division with tiles X. We can make a pattern of tiles for the background by checking the properties of X and Y. For example, if X plus Y is divisible by two, then we'll write a tile index of F into the corresponding memory location. Notice that we're now writing into the general address space using the memory mapper rather than writing to a particular device like we did with tile data. If X plus Y is not divisible by two, but is divisible by three, then we'll write a tile index of A. If it's anything else, then we'll write a tile index of four. Now we can set up some sprites. The sprite table starts at hex address 2020 and describes up to 32 sprites each of which is described by a 16 byte data structure. We'll set up two sprites here, one which will represent the player and one which will represent an NPC. The first two bytes refer to the X position. We'll just set that to zero. Then after that is a two byte representation of the Y position. We'll set that to 64. The byte after that refers to a tile index and we'll choose one that's different to the background tiles let's say six. Now we can set up another sprite in the same way, but using different starting values. Next, we're going to create a controller input device. As we saw in the last episode, the controller has eight buttons. The directions up, down, left and right, two primary interaction buttons A and B, and two secondary interaction buttons start and select. These buttons can be either pressed or not pressed, which will represent a one or a zero at a particular byte in memory. We'll be getting our data from the keyboard, but there's no reason you couldn't hook this up to a real game controller using the gamepad API in the browser. We'll create an array with eight values that will track the states of each of these buttons. We can add a key down event listener to the document and check which key was pressed. If it happens to be any of the keys that relate to the controller, we'll set a corresponding value in the array to a one. Later on, when we come to set up the main game loop, we'll latch this data into input memory at the beginning of a frame. To come back to the tile caching mechanism that we wrote at the beginning of the episode, we can now cache all 256 tiles into pre-rendered canvas images by creating an array and looping from zero to tile memory size incrementing by 32 each iteration. In the body of the loop, we'll push a new tile made up of the corresponding 32 bytes in tile memory. We've set up almost everything in memory now, but we still need some code to run and we're going to need to set up the interrupt vector. We can easily add some code using the assemble function. We'll create a constant for the code offset and destructure game machine code and symbols from a call to assemble. The code we write here will just be a minimal stub to get the machine running and rendering. We'll use template strings to format the assembly code and we'll pass code offset as the base address. All of the labels and the other symbols will be created in reference to this address. We'll create a label for start and then immediately a label called wait. Inside wait, we'll have a single instruction that moves the address of the wait label into the instruction pointer effectively creating an infinite loop. Finally, we'll add one more label called afterframe. This will contain an interrupt handler for the machine that will initiate for us when the frame has finished rendering. This will allow us to work out how to continue running the game logic later, but for now, we'll simply place a return from interrupt instruction inside. This will set the machine back wherever it was running before the frame rendering took place. In this case, just back into our infinite loop. We can load the game code into memory by looping over all of the bytes and writing them into memory at the correct offset. To set up the interrupt vector, we'll create a constant specifying its address and fill out two entries. The first entry is the address of the reset vector. 
that is where the code will begin executing from. This could potentially be anywhere we like, but for now it will just be code offset. The second entry in the vector is the address of the frame complete interrupt handler. This will be our after frame label. And luckily we don't need to manually work that out by hand. We can just reference its address from symbols.afterframe. Next, we can initialize a CPU. We'll pass the memory mapper as the first argument and the interrupt vector offset as the second. And now with all the memory mapped out, the game code and data loaded, and the CPU initialized, we just have to set up rendering and the game loop. First, we'll create some constants which are related to the frame rate of the game. We'll aim to render at 30 frames per second, although this can be brought down if we need to. The time per frame in milliseconds then is 1000 divided by the target FPS. I'll also add one more constant here, which will be the number of ticks that we run the CPU between frames and when a frame finishes rendering. This number can also be tweaked later. We can initialize a renderer, passing the screen canvas, and create a mutable variable called last, which will keep track of the last time we drew a frame to the screen. We're going to use request animation frame again, so we'll create a draw callback function and inside grab the current timestamp. We can then calculate the difference by subtracting now from last and check to see if that number measured in milliseconds is greater than the time that we need to wait between drawing frames. If it is, then we'll set last to now and we'll latch the input values into memory. To do this, we can load the input array into memory and then clear all of the states back to zero. The implication here is that if the player presses a key during the frame period, that key will be considered pressed, even if they release it before the next frame is drawn. Next, we can actually do some drawing. First, we'll loop through the background tiles just like we did before, grabbing the cache tile using the index. Then we can call draw grid aligned tile with the X, Y, and cache tile. On top of the background, we'll want to draw the 32 sprites. We can similarly loop from zero to 32 and calculate a base address for this sprite. That will be the address of the sprite table plus i multiplied by 16, since the sprite is a 16 byte data structure. We can then grab the x and the y positions as well as the tile index by reading from memory at the correct offset. The final tile index is actually a combination of the tile and the animation offset. Since we didn't actually set the animation index, that will be zero and will have no effect. Finally, we can call draw pixel aligned tile. The foreground is then drawn on top of the sprites and is virtually identical to the background loop. Only this time we use foreground offset instead of background offset to locate the tile index. In the future, we'll be making this routine much more sophisticated, adding support for scrolling the background and foreground, as well as applying drawing effects to sprites. But for now, we'll consider the frame drawing complete. When the frame is finished, we'll simulate the graphics hardware signaling to the CPU by triggering an interrupt, the index of which is 1, and index 1 is where we put the frame complete handler in the interrupt vector. We haven't actually run any code on the CPU, so below, whether we drew a frame or not, we're going to call step on the CPU based on the number of times that we have in cycles per animation frame. And at the end of this function, we'll queue up the next call to request animation frame with the draw callback. And of course, outside of the callback, we need to get the ball rolling by calling this function once ourselves. And with that, we've written all of the code to wire up the machine. We can change the JavaScript file in our index.html to point to console.js and then run npm run start in the terminal to build and serve the project. If we take a look in the browser, we'll see the programmatically generated background made of three different tiles, as well as our two sprites. The code is just an infinite loop, so of course nothing is actually happening, but our fantasy console is most definitely wired up and running. In the next episode, we'll write some assembly code and create a very simple game. If you want to keep up with this series, consider subscribing on YouTube or joining the mailing list at tinyletter.com forward slash low-level JavaScript. Thank you to all of the patrons of this channel. 
Your continued support and enthusiasm for these videos is a massive motivator to keep making strange projects. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.